Hello and welcome to Global Health TV. Today we'll be looking at climate change, the single biggest health threat facing humanity. The climate crisis threatens to undo the last 50 years of progress in development, global health and poverty reduction, and to further widen existing health inequalities between and within populations. At the recent American Geophysical Union meeting in Chicago, Illinois, 25,000 attendees from over 100 countries came together to share research, network, and to better understand our planet and environment. My colleague Laura Krantz spoke to Dr. May Sule, an environmental engineer from Cranfield University, specialising in the interactions between water, sanitation, hygiene and health systems. She says our climate crisis is a water crisis. We're joined now by May Sule. May, thanks so much for coming in to talk to us. Thank you very much for having me. Tell me a little bit about how global health is linked to water security. Okay, so when we say water security, we're talking about the quantity and the quality of water. So when um, the quantity is insufficient or the quality of water is compromised, there are contaminants in the water, it affects um, the quality of the water and um, people can fall sick from drinking that water or from using that water source in the first place. So most times, um, when we think of water security, we're not really considering the fact that it's health involved. And most of the global um, health issues are all around water. So if you look at the diarrheal diseases, if you look at the neglected tropical diseases, when you think of schistosomiasis, that's bilharzia, or um, trachoma, or onchocerciasis, river blindness, the disability that comes with that, uh, most of it is directly linked to water. So water security affects the global health. The global burden of disease in terms of disability adjusted life years, it's really very high when you think of um, the impact that water has on people's livelihoods or quality of life generally. So water security in terms of health, it's quite a huge, huge impact. That's a link because most times the life cycle of most diseases are linked to water. Okay, and then how are both those things, global health and water security, affected by climate change? So when we say climate change, <laughs> most times climate change is associated with water. In fact, the climate crisis, I would say, is a water crisis. Because um, when we think of climate, the first, thing we think, the first things we think about are either floods or drought, things around water. Either too much of the water in floods or too little of the water in droughts. And when you have floods, the tendency is that the floods, the water will wash away contaminants from land, from land surfaces or from drains, and it's all over the place. So you tend to have breakout of waterborne diseases. You have outbreak of diarrhea, of cholera, of um, other um, intestinal uh, ailments that could cause mortality rates to go up or people to really fall sick. And we also have droughts when you have no water at all, and people have to seek for alternative water sources that are unsafe, or they um, compromise on their hygiene. So it's what, some of the things that you have as a result of drought and floods. So it's all interconnected. Since the climate crisis is a water crisis, definitely water security is increased, or um, it, 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 the cases of uh, issues around water, floods, droughts, becomes much more frequent. And so people are more likely now to be affected by the consequences of, of climate change. Um, so you had a poster at this, at this year at AGU. Uh, it was called Water and Health in a Volatile Climate, Science-Based Strategies for Equitable Well-Being in a Water-Secure Future. Can you outline some of the key research points of this poster? The first one I'll say is the one to do with groundwater and health. Uh, most times we think in developing countries that if we just go ahead and we um, tap into the groundwater by drilling boreholes or deep wells that are considered safe, in quotes, um, people can just access that water and, uh, and it's healthy, it's good water, it's clean water, uncontaminated, and they can go ahead and drink the water. But we forget that most times they're geogenic contaminants. Those are contaminants that are within the Earth's surface. So you have fluoride, you have um, selenium, you have arsenic right uh, across the strata of the, 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 the soil. So those um, contaminants tend to wash into the groundwater. The, the water flows into the groundwater with the contaminants. And when people drink that water untreated, they still end up falling sick or 
um, having these other side effects from those uh, chemical compounds that are in the water. So also when you have pit latrines in, around um, wells, then there's likely to be permeation of the contaminants, the pathogens from the pit latrine into the groundwater. So we're looking at how um, people could be sensitized to understand that groundwater may actually require additional treatment before it is safe for consumption by people. That's one of the things that we have come up with at um, the session. Another thing we have also considered is the impact of drought on water, wastewater, and um, sanitation and health. So considering the fact that um, when people do not have access to clean water, like I explained, they go for alternative sources. Looking also at the impact of uranium mm. in water. That's a research that has been carried out in Michigan here in the United States. So a lot of people use groundwater sources and they've now discovered that most of the groundwater sources are actually polluted with uranium. And so what do you do about that? How do you sensitize people to use filters, even when, when they have the groundwater available? They should use additional filters to ensure that uranium is filtered out of the water and it's now safe for them to consume for drinking purposes. So those are some of the highlights of the session. There are quite a number, but those are the ones I've pulled out. Can you talk a little bit more about the research that's been done into groundwater contamination and or groundwater treatment in low income areas? So um, there's not so much research that has gone into the solution. Okay, there's quite a lot of research that has gone into identifying the contaminants in the water, for example, in Kenya and Ethiopia. So you have many people, uh, many researchers that have gone out and have tested the quality of the water in so many locations in those two countries, in Ethiopia and Tanzania. And they've realized that the quality of the water is really very poor. There are a lot of chemical contaminants in the water. Um, fluoride content is high, selenium content is high. Uh, you have high con uh, arsenic content as well. And other um, aesthetic contaminants as well that, that are in the water, high iron content. So although iron may not be very dangerous when you consume it, but it changes the color of the water aesthetically. So many people will not want to drink water that is already looking colored yeah. in the first place. So you tend to find those issues. But the problem is um, the groundwater quality monitoring has not been very efficient. You just have the one-off studies that researchers have carried in a few locations. So different researchers have carried out different um, studies across Ethiopia and, uh, and um, Kenya over many years. And so we've pulled out all those studies together to identify the contaminants that they had um, tested and, and have the, the data available in the studies that they have done. So we have pulled all that together. And realistically, when we considered all the results, a lot needs to be done um, because many times the assumption that groundwater is safe has just been, uh, it's come to light that groundwater is really not safe until you know the quality of the water itself by testing it and by identifying the contaminants that may require additional treatment for that water to be safe for consumption. What do you think the research priorities for global health and water security should be moving forward? In my opinion, I think um, what needs to be done is looking at uh, more mitigation, risk mitigation factors how do we consider the pathways of exposure to contaminated water? And what can we do in intervening, mitigating the risk of exposure from those pathways? Also, um, looking at more research in low, lower and middle income countries. Um, there's so much out there, especially when it comes to drought on developed countries, but very minimum information is out there to do with uh, developing countries. And they're the ones that suffer the most from the impact of climate change on water. So I think more studies need to be done, to be carried out for those areas. And also um, a lot needs to be done around water and health. So there's minimum studies as well, linking the pathways to exposure of disease and water, especially when it's not the diarrhea, cholera, um, one that most people are used to. There are a lot of other um, diseases that are caused by water. So understanding the pathways to exposure, the risks involved, and then mitigation measures around those um, risks will be a good way to go in terms of future research. Climate change is pretty scary for a lot of people. Is there anything that gives you hope as you look into the future? 
I think many people now are very interested in climate issues because we are beginning to see the manifestation um, of climate issues clearly. You know, so I get very encouraged that I see the youth now being very involved and wanting change to happen. Um, Greta Thunberg is one person who has <laughs> raised so much awareness around um, the climate and climate change. So it's, it's quite encouraging. That gives me a lot of hope because many people are now considering what they could do. Um, little behavior ch behavioral changes that they could adopt that will ha have an impact on the climate. So I think that's very encouraging. For me personally, it's realistic in terms of I have children. So when I think of my grandchildren who are yet unborn, they're the ones who will be most affected in the future. So what can we do now to help um, live a better world for them in the future? So that's, that's what motivates me, really. Good. Well, that seems like a, a good thing to, to keep you going. Yeah. Uh, May Sule, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure and an honor. Yeah. Protecting the health of future generations is also a focus for our next guest, Dr. Caitlin O'Dell, an atmospheric scientist from George Washington University. Laura Kratz caught up with her at the AGU in Chicago, Illinois, about her work incorporating health and equity into climate policies and planning. And we're joined now by Kate O'Dell. Kate, thanks for coming in today. Thank you for having me. So tell me a little bit about how climate change affects global health. Climate change impacts global health in a lot of ways. Um, for example, climate change exacerbates a lot of extreme events that we know also have negative impacts on public health, like uh, extreme heat or wildfires in the western United States. And we also know uh, burning fossil fuels, right, which emits greenhouse gases that cause climate change, also emit pollutants that have negative impacts on health as well. Great. Well, not great. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's good information to know and think about those two things in, con, in, you know, together in conjunction. Why is it critical to include health and equity benefits of climate mitigation into climate policies and planning? Yeah, so the pathways that we uh, choose to take to mitigate climate change can also lead to benefits for environmental injustice. They can lead to benefits for protecting the health of future generations and can also have co-benefits for public health in the present day through uh, improved air quality or access to green space and other avenues. And so when we leave those uh, potential co-benefits of climate action kind of out of the picture when we are assessing these different policies, we really underestimate the benefits of climate action, not only for future generations, but also for us in the here and now. Okay. Um, I'm going to now ask you about your poster session. I have to read the title because it's a long one. So you, your poster session was called Bringing Health to the Room Where It Happens, Incorporating Health and Equity into Climate Policies and Planning. What were some of the key points? Yes, I think there were a few key themes and takeaways from our session. Um, we had a couple presenters that talked about improved air quality through different pathways to reduce carbon emissions in the U.S. So one um, looked at improved air quality from a tra full transition to electric vehicles. Another looked at improved air quality again, um, but from transitioning to a net zero energy sector across the full U.S. Um, we also had a few uh, presenters that look at local climate action. Um, so they work with a network of cities around the world that have mayors that are committed to climate action, and that network is called C40. Um, and so these presenters, one of them looked at um, access to green space in these cities and how we can assess the health benefits of meeting different targets that those cities have set for green space. And another looked at how local climate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in those cities could also have benefits for air quality um, and subsequently for public health. And they found that those benefits not only are felt by the, the local city taking the action, but also um, kind of in the broader surrounding nations as well. And then a few of our presenters also looked um, at more of like a system style approach of these different uh, pathways to reducing greenhouse gas emissions through uh, green buildings and um, carbon, global carbon pricing. And those studies were really interesting because they found that by including health and equity considerations in climate policies and planning, we can not only support you know, good policy, but also potentially identify policies that might have unintended negative impacts on air pollution and health and equity. And so it's really important to kind of add those considerations in. 
Um, and then one final point that I think was a key thread of almost all, if not all, of our posters and, and presenters and what they talked about is just working with the communities that we're studying, working with the decision makers so that we are assessing policies that um, that they're thinking about that are feasible for them. Um, and so a lot of our presenters actually already doing that, which is great, and others kind of um, drove home the point that that's really important, not only in the field of thinking about climate policies and health and equity, but just geohealth more broadly. Can you tell me a little bit more about your own research into urban pollution and health? So my current work is focused on uh, scoping out the potential health and equity benefits that could be realized with future geostationary or sub-daily observations of atmospheric composition from satellites. And so we're working with some partners at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, um, to kind of quantify those uh, potential benefits and like use that quantification to help advocate for the satellite mission and advocate for these observations of atmospheric composition, which will be really important in the future to just continue to observe air pollution and protect health in the US. So if you were in charge, what would you like to see happen in terms of your research priorities for global health and um, climate policies? I think the main priority and what we should really focus on is, is working with the communities and the decision makers so that um, we're making sure that we're doing analysis of, of policy that's feasible for them, that's, that's applicable. And hopefully by doing that, we are generating information that can be used to support policy um, that can actually be adopted. Climate change is scary. I think a lot of people are kind of frightened about it. Is there something that gives you hope for the future? I think for me, it's really being able to identify these quote like win, win, wins for climate, health, and equity. And I think thinking about you know these paths that we're taking and how we can turn them into a solution space for multiple problems. I think for me, is really exciting and really inspiring. You know, climate change thinking about the future can be really scary and and have a lot of ne and does have a lot of negative potential implications for the future if we don't take action. But I think sometimes it's nice to kind of spin that the other way and be like, well, if we do take action, there's a lot of great things and a lot of positive impact that we could have on the world. And that really inspires me. Kate Odell, thanks so much for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you so much for having me. Community science leader Carmen George works across the 27,000 square miles of Navajo Nation in the southwestern U.S., encouraging young people to make healthy choices. One of the biggest health challenges the community faces is access to clean drinking water. The Navajo Nation's Department of Water Resources has estimated that 30% of nation residents lack access to running water and must haul water to their homes, often driving miles to a pickup location, which is often a community well. I am joined by Carmen George. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me. So let's start by talking a little bit about where you're from, what the environment is like, and, and why you're doing the kind of work you're doing there. Yeah, I am from um, a little town called Baclobito. It's near the Four Corners area of the United States. And um, from the Navajo Reservation, roughly the size of West Virginia, they say, and um, yeah, just have lived there all my life, and it's different. Like it has some desert, it has mountains. Um, it's kind of different terrains. It's an environment that is, you know, where people live is kind of spread out. There's not a lot of fresh food. There's not a lot of water, and so this is kind of a big concern for you. Yeah. So where um, Navajo Nation sits is between what we call our four sacred mountains. And so that's where we live and reside within those um, mountains. And we have um, some rivers there, um, underground water. It is pretty um, sparse as far as um, grocery stores. So there's probably 14. And, but we have over 100 convenience stores. And so our organization, we try to work with not only the big grocery stores, but also the smaller um, convenience stores in the communities to help them to offer fresh fruits and vegetables to the community. Okay, and tell me a little bit more about your organization. What's the name of it? What are the goals? Yeah, so I work for an organization called Community Outreach and Patient Empowerment. It's a sister organization to Partners in Health out of Boston. 
And so within that, um, I work on the research and evaluation team, which sits under Brigham and Women's Hospital. So all of those are connected through our Partners in Health Network. We're a nonprofit, um, Native-led, and um, we work on different public health initiatives. We have like the fruit and vegetable prescription program. We have the water um, promotion um, program. We have training and outreach. We work closely with the community health representatives on Navajo Nation. So that's just kind of a small part of what we do. There's more that we do in the public health field. Yeah, and there's a lot of focus on water. You know, obviously being in a desert area, water is very important. And also water has a lot of meaning for people on the Navajo Nation. When I first joined um, COPE, we were promoting um, fresh fruits and vegetables. We um, realized it's also important to um, promote healthy beverages because people might be eating healthy but maybe they're eating a salad with a soda. <laughs> so just trying to promote um, healthy eating and drinking on Navajo Nation, I feel like that's important. And there's a um, statistic that says that one in four um, children on Navajo will develop diabetes type two. And so because of that, we're just trying to prolong that diagnosis. So it's not if, but it's when they, they will get diabetes. And so I think that was really stunning to me. And so just trying to develop those healthy habits at an early age where children are um, choosing fruits and vegetables, water, um, unsweetened drinks, I feel like that's really important because in the long run that'll help to push back that diagnosis of diabetes and they won't have to live with that, you know, early on in their life and I think now they're starting to diagnose them earlier so even kids like 12 years old are developing adult onset diabetes and that's really tragic. Yes. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's an, there's an element of, of sacredness, too, to water in the Navajo Nation. Yeah, so I feel like it's really important when we talk about water, and especially with the youth, to talk about the cultural and traditional aspects of water, because we have four clans, and so a lot of our clans stem from water. So there's a lot of... And a lot of the names of our towns are in water. There's a lot of sacredness in water because water is considered a living being. And so that's really important when we talk about water because we want to be reverent to it and be positive. And so I think that's one approach that we try to do with our project is to always be positive and to speak kindly about water because it is very sacred and it's really important to keep that in mind. Yeah, that seems like a lesson that everybody could take from you in terms of, you know, as we move forward and with climate change and with the potential for drought and water becoming a scarcity and a much more valuable resource than it already is, thinking about it from a sacred perspective and something that we should be protecting. So um, that, does, that does seem like something that scientists and, and people all over the world could stand to learn from your community. Yeah, I think that's really important and something that I hope that this project that the youth come out with, like I hope when they finish our project that they have that respect and that they do do, um, you know, that they have that reverence for water. Well, thank you for joining us today, Carmen George. It's been a pleasure talking with you. All right, thank you. That's all for this show. Next time, we'll be looking at the environmental impact of wildfires and extreme heat events on health with experts at the Society of Toxicology annual meeting in Nashville, Tennessee. Until then, it's goodbye.